me and my body have come into an understanding with each other that that's not where we want to exist. It's not how we want to exist right now. Yo, I'm doing something a little different this time, which is sort of like a video journal where I haven't really fully thought these thoughts out. It's just like just getting in front of the camera and wanting to get this stuff out and hopefully I'll make sense. I'm gonna to try to organize it in a way that is empathetic to the listener, <laughs> um, that it sort of follows some uh, coherent train of thought. Uh, but this is about the power of language and the effects that it has on the way that we interact with ourselves and those around us. Uh, I'm a very tall, I'm six foot seven, and for most of my life, been a very skinny person. I've put on some muscle mass uh, later on, but for the most part, you know, seventh, eighth grade, especially high school and college was like super tall, super skinny, was teased about that a lot. And um, it just caused me to have a very awkward relationship to my my body, being that tall, hovering over people that high and always having attention drawn to it in public by strangers. It still happens to this day. Uh, and then not, and then the height mixed with the the weight, me being very skinny. That also brought a lot of comments about my my weight and my uh, the way that I looked. And I just always had this really awkward relationship to my body because of that, and oftentimes very negative relationship to my body because of my height and my weight. And then, you know, fast forward, diving into Christianity more, that was another way that my relationship to my body became very awkward and oftentimes negative. And today was the first time in a while, I guess, that I've had this sort of aha moment about my relationship to my body and how that came through Christianity and so forth. And so I bring up Christianity and I also bring up my height and all that to sort of tie into this experience that I had today. I went to yoga in the park and I've been wanting to do that for a long time. Um, I've been wanting to get into yoga for a long time in general because I just want improved flexibility and sort of, I've just always not been very flexible. I've always had really tight hamstrings and really tight hips. So you tie that within having very long limbs. Yoga is a struggle for your boy. It is a, <laughs> man, it is a, is a, it's a struggle. And it often puts you into these very awkward situations, uh, awkward positions and, even more so, it's awkward when you're doing it in front of people. And so I've not been so good with yoga because I get so frustrated with my body when I'm doing it. Uh, I look around and I see other people who have been doing it for a long time and how well they can do yoga. Even people who don't do it very much, they're typically shorter than me and more flexible than me. So they don't they oftentimes don't look as awkward as I do. Um and so I get really frustrated and I get very negative and very comparative with my body when it comes to yoga. And um, I tend, I seem to be so far from where people have been doing it for a while. I, it feels impossible for me to get good at yoga. And so I keep kind of putting it down. And then today was the first time that I realized um the need for me to be gentle and for me to be kind with the language that I use towards my body when I'm speaking to myself in my head voice. We all have this voice in our head that speaks to us and it has a sort of baseline temperament towards ourselves. If you think about it, if you really analyze that voice that's in your head, it can be either very kind to you or it's a very mean voice or it's a very negative voice or maybe it's a very optimistic voice. Uh, it's a very, Maybe it's a very factual voice or maybe it's a very emotional voice, but that voice has a temperament that is toward you. And that temperament is not, not necessarily always aimed towards other people. Sometimes it does manifest in that way, but there is a voice that is for you, that is to you. And oftentimes that voice for me can be very uh, negative in situations. And I know that this comes, this is due largely to two things. One, that's just my general temperament. Right. Like that's just kind of how I tend to 
address myself, but I, I can't help but think that it has something to do with Christianity as well. This is not a pointing of the finger and saying, you know, I know some people want to listen to this and, and say, oh, see, this is why I left per se. No, it's more so me thinking about the things, me going back and looking and critiquing um, ways that I was, that I learned from the Bible, I learned from Christian community in order, the ways that I learned to interact with myself that I'm looking back on now and I'm like, you know what, that probably wasn't the best way. I think of scriptures that say things like, you know, I beat my body into submission or, you know, um, we talk about dying to the flesh daily, this sort of death that must happen to this flesh. Um, that is a, off, a very common thing, circumcision of the flesh. It's a cutting away of the flesh. And you think of this uh, negative disposition towards the body, towards the flesh, towards the natural man. Um, the flesh thinks like this, the spirit thinks like this. And there's this duality of spirit and flesh. And oftentimes we see the spirit being the good thing and the flesh is always a negative thing. It always has a negative position. The body has a negative disposition. Granted, there's some good things the body is presented in good ways too in the Bible. I think the analogies and metaphors that are used are, are, are often the disposition towards the body is, uh, depends on where you want to land that day. Because in some ways the body is a temple and it's a good thing. But in other ways, it's also a very negative thing that you want to be putting to death, that you want to be killing, um, that you want to be cutting away and you want to be doing violence towards the body. I know that sounds like very strong language, but it's, it's true when you think about it. Like what is death, but uh, what is killing, but violence to its furthest conclusion? Um, you are to be committing violence towards the body. Um, you know, if your right eye caused you to sin, gouge it out. If your left hand, or I forget the left or right now, what Jesus says, but you want to cut it off, do violence towards the body. Um, and that is supposed to be the way that we have self-control over the body is that we beat it into submission. We do violence towards it until it submits to um, the will of God and into and righteousness and you know again this is me processing this i don't think that it's fully negative to see like man sometimes you know self-control being this thing that needs to have firmness and it needs to have sometimes need to be aggressive in the way that you are having self-control um but to what extent is where like i disagree uh, as far as the Bible goes. And I, and I think I was seeing uh, today was the first time when I'm doing yoga. And this is not some mystical thing that I have around yoga or whatever. This is just like anything that you want to do, whether you're lifting weights, whatever it may be. I think the better way that I want to engage with my body is not is not the submission that is caused by beating, but the submissions that is caused by understanding. As Paul, who also suggests that, like, you know, husbands live in understanding with your wives. And we don't if the and if the wife is supposed to listen to the husband in the biblical model. Well, the 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 husband, if he is the head of that body, the head, that 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 household and the two have become one flesh. Well, now, again, there goes the flesh again. Well, in that one flesh union, uh, the way that the husband is to cause. um uh, submission in that one flesh is not by beating his wife or being violent towards her, or having violent language towards her. We know that the children that he has uh, is not is not by violence. The children are to obey their parents, but it's not because of a violence given to them. But rather, he's supposed to live in understanding. And. um I think of that idea, that concept as towards myself when I'm thinking about my body and, and living and understanding with it uh, when rather than speaking violence towards it and speaking negatively uh, towards myself uh, and, the, and when my body doesn't do what I want it to do, um, rather living and understanding with it and wanting to woo it into a space of submission and, and, and trying to more so guide it into a space that is more beneficial for itself. You know, 
Um, we do violence to our body. And eventually, if we despise our body enough, our, our bodies despise it back. You, you feed it enough fast food and junk food, you're despising your body, it's gonna despise you back. Or even in the opposite, you wanna be so healthy, you despise the way that you look so much that you take it to the gym and you beat it and you beat it and you beat it under the weights and under cardio and all that. And eventually, if you don't give it a rest, if you despise it so much, it will shut down on you as well. It gets sick, it passes out, it does all kinds of things. Uh, when you despise it versus wanting to live in understanding when you're listening to your body when it says, you know what? Hey, I'm not with this right now. I don't want to do this. I don't want to do this right now. This is not, you know, and it's a it's a it's a, a relationship that you have where the body gets to talk to you. and You get to talk to the body and you tell the body, you know, sometimes the body says, I don't feel like doing this. And you're saying, well, you know what? I thought about it. I do think this is a good thing for us to go and do this. Let's do this. Let's push ourselves to this space where there's food that you're not supposed to be eating or food that you should be eating. And the body's saying, I crave sugar. And it's like, well, hey, I know you crave this. And I understand. I want to live in understanding why you're craving that rather than shaming you about it. You understand. Why do you want sugar? Well, my, you know, I could be addicted to the sugar. There's a certain, you know, maybe there's some uh, mental health relation uh, uh, issues behind it or whatever it may be. Why you're craving these things. Rather than shaming yourself for living understanding and say, I understand why you want that, but let's figure out a way um, where you like we get you to a space that is more healthy so that you can live longer, so that you can live more fully, that you are not a burden to yourself and a burden to others. You know. Um, and so I think of that. You know, not just in terms of yoga, but of course, you know, one of the main ways the body, uh, the, the Bible talks about um, negatively about the body is its passions, is its, its, its desires, its sexual desires that it has. Uh, it speaks of it positively when it talks about it as a temple, but it also talks about it very much negatively in a thing that, you know, these passions that arise, um, that they should be cut away um, and, and oftentimes it speaks about that in terms of uh, the sexuality. And even that, like, this could be a whole video in, in and of itself. I've had to, I have, I've had to relearn the way of interacting with myself when it comes to sexual self-control, self-control around the sexuality, um, and having restraint around that. Um, I think that what has proven to be more beneficial to me has been living and understanding with my body when it comes to that, and I haven't been as uh, there have definitely have been moments I've been more shameful with it as the tendency that I've taken over from Christianity. Um, but the better space is, is understanding, you know? Um, and I've, I've, I've been able to sort of gently guide my body and its desires into a more uh, healthy and fruitful space. And I guess I can, I don't want to speak too literally because I don't, I, Quite frankly, I don't want y'all in my business like that, <laughs> but I think it does bear fleshing out some a little bit. Right. Um, for, for me currently, um, I am abstinent. Uh, I am um, restraining from having sex at the time. And, you know, it's not the same as when I was a Christian where like if I. If I do have sex and it's like this big like fallout thing and I'm going to shame myself and I got to go confess it to somebody or whatever. Uh, it's not some badge of honor I'm going to hold up either of like I've been I've been abstinent for one year, two years, three years, four years. And I haven't had, you know, it's it's not going to be any of that around it, but more so um, I've just me and my body have come into an understanding with each other that that's not where we want to exist. That's not how we want to exist right now. Uh, I, I'm not saying everyone should live by what I'm doing and how I'm doing it. And uh, I'm not even saying that that's going to be the forever thing, you know, but uh, I, I have learned that, um, you know, having, I've learned that I don't want I don't want to engage in sexuality in the way that uh, that is oftentimes very encouraged um, in our culture, in our society, the, the quote unquote sexual liberation. 
um, I still carry over some of the principle that I've learned in Christian space, which I think is really true, is the idea that if you're not free to not do something, then you're not free to do it. Uh, I remember talking about that as a Christian around alcohol, and I believe the same thing. Like people who are not free to not drink alcohol are not free to drink it, Under the, meaning if you're so addicted to alcohol, if you don't have the freedom of choice to say, no, I don't, I'm cool, I don't need to drink, I can drink, but I don't want to, I'm good. If you don't have the freedom to make that choice, and the only choice you can make is to drink, then you shouldn't be drinking. If you're not free to not do something, then you're not free to do it. Because in doing it, Without a choice, freedom suggests the idea that there are choices involved. And, and therefore, if the only choice that you have is to drink, then you don't have a choice, <laughs> which is not freedom. Um, and so I, I think the same way when it comes to sexuality, whether it be the, the intercourse that you may have with other people, the sexual intimacy, intimacy that you may share with someone else, um, or even when it comes down to pornography and masturbation and so forth. And, um, you know, if it is to a point where it's like, yo, well, now that I'm, you know, I'm outside of this Christian rules and stuff like that, I'm free to do whatever I want to do. And you are fully addicted to pornography. Your body has no other choice but to watch pornography or has no other choice but to masturbate, has no choice but to um go out and have sex whenever it is presented to you, you don't have any control over your, you don't have any real choices. And so you're oftentimes forced to put yourself, put your body into spaces that it doesn't, uh, or your body goes into it, one part of your body goes into it, um, but your mind really doesn't want to be there. And so you're forcing your mind into spaces it doesn't want to be, or otherwise. Sometimes there are people, there's been situations, it's the opposite where, your body fully well knows that it doesn't want to be here, that it doesn't want to have sex with this person. It doesn't want to, it doesn't want to be in this space with this person. And yet mentally you feel like you have to, for whatever reason, when you insert whatever reason it might be, your mind feels like it has to be here. It has to do this. And your body's like, but I don't want to. And you force your body into spaces that it doesn't belong. Um, that is also another form of, of, of captivity and lack of freedom and, and, and a sort of violence that you do to your body. Um, I don't want to go as far to say, you know, something, um, you know, for shock value or whatever, but there is a level of you uh, are essentially splitting yourself in two. There's no understanding or agreement between the mind and the body and you're forcing either the mind is forcing the body or the body is forcing the mind to go into a space that it doesn't want to be in where the body has not given consent to the mind and the mind is not given cons or the mind has not given consent to the body. And yet they f one or the other forces the other into that situation. And it is a type of violence that you do to your mind. Uh, a sort of trauma that you put yourself into. You put the body through a trauma. You put your mind through a trauma. Um, rather than living in understanding with your mind, or rather than your body living in understanding with your mind, or vice versa, the mind living in understanding with the body. Um, and I think that's a, a better place to be in so that when you do, f you know, uh, find yourself doing something that you didn't want to do, um, there's not a shame that you have to give yourself it's a you move forward in understanding and say, see, you did that and you see how that how you felt afterwards. You feel you, you, you understand more how this is not a space that you want to exist in. And I'm not going to beat you for that. I'm not going to try to beat you into submission and shame you and guilt you into it. Um, there's not going to be any violence that's put on to you. But rather, let's like, can we sit and reason together and understand that this is how, how do we want to. How do we want to find joy and satisfaction and intimacy in more fulfilling ways, in, in ways that are more satisfying, more long term, that has more long term gratification rather than short term, temporal, immediate gratification? Um, and that's the way that I want to live in understanding with my body. Um, and I'm not going to. 
I'm not going to do violence towards it. And so today, just thinking through that, I think it wasn't anything that the yoga instructor specifically said. It was just the way that she was in, the way that she was saying things and kind of how she was encouraging us. You know, you know, she would tell us to do this one particular move. And then she was like, you know, and if it doesn't go that far, like, that's fine. It's OK. And it's like, yeah, that is OK. Like if I can't, <laughs> you know, so if I can't grab my toes right now, that is OK. Like I'm not going to be mad at my body for not being able to grab the toe. Like that's where we are right now. And that's OK. I'm living in understanding with my body. You know, if I get back to the gym, I haven't been in the gym in a while and I can't bench what I was benching before. It's like. I'm no longer like, oh my God, I'm go ahead and go back home. This is, you know how it feels when you haven't been to the gym in a while and you, you look in the mirror and you're like, man, I am fatter than what I, <laughs> than where I came from. Like I, I felt like I lost all this weight. Now I'm back to being overweight or vice versa. I, I gained all this muscle and now look at me, I'm all scrawny and you shame and beat, you beat yourself in the mirror. You, you, you shame and you guilt yourself. You flog yourself in private. Um, Rather than just being like, all right, that's where we are right now. But we understand that greater satisfaction is on the other side of like we we have a goal of healthiness and fitness. And it's like, well, that's where we want to be. That's OK. I'm going to walk in understanding with you and we're going to get to that goal. And, and we don't have to get there um, by me shaming or beating you. Again, I think the analogy of I think it's great. And sometimes Paul has great advice sometimes where, it, again, we're talking about like live in understanding with your wives. I think it should be vice versa. I think, you know, and it. Uh, egalitarian um, relationship where the woman also lives in understanding with her husband, uh, whoever your partner is. And rather than trying to shame and guilt and uh, abuse somebody into submitting to you and, or agreeing with you, it's like rather let's let's understand one another so that we can reach an agreement together. And I want to have that type of relationship with my mind, with my body. It's the only one I get. Um, the way that I eat, the way that I sleep, the way that I drink or don't drink, the way that I smoke or don't smoke, um, engage sexually or, or choose not to engage sexually. I want to live in full understanding uh, with my body and, vice, and, 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 and the other way around. Uh, for more, uh, this word that's been popping up for me is congruent live a life that is congruent, which really just means to live in harmony. The whole goal is to live in harmony. I want to live in harmony with myself. I want to make decisions that are in harmony with other decisions I've made, other desires that I have, have a harmonious relationship with myself, which in turn allows me to have a more harmonious relationship with those around me. That when I live, when, when I'm able to make a habit and a practice of living and understanding with myself, it is far easier for me to live in patience and understanding with those around me. It's no surprise, it shouldn't be a surprise or a curious thing that when I choose the method of beating myself into submission and shaming myself and, and guilting myself into obedience, when people around me don't agree with me, when they don't obey me or they don't get what I'm trying to do and they don't follow me, like. It's no surprise when I engage with them in, in shameful, guiltful, uh, maybe even sometimes abusive, violent ways, uh, or at least that it shows signs of that. That it, it, I, 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 I truly believe that our lives are, are not and cannot be as compartmentalized as we think. We are one entity uh, and maybe um, features of ourselves show up more prominently and more clearly in other spaces of our lives, but it's not to say that they don't show up at all in other spaces just because they're more clear in another space. It pours over. Uh, the way that you treat yourself, you, the way that you treat yourself uh, shows up in the way that you play basketball, shows up in the way that you treat your friends and your wife or your husband or your brothers and your sisters, your parents, um, the way that you treat yourself in the gym. Uh, the way that you see strangers around you, the way you see life. Um, I would even say there's a sort of a, a way that you see um, the God that you worship. It has a, a if the God that you worship um, very much lives in the mind. And I don't mean that in a negative or I, I, I genuinely mean in, in the most 
heartfelt way, if you truly believe that God is real, then if you cannot see him, uh, if you cannot see God as an invisible, then much of the features that you and the much of the things that you uh, experience him doing happen in the mind. You may say it happens in the soul and the spirit. That's fine, too. Uh, but either way, it's happening in you. It's happening in you. This relationship, prayer and so forth. And um, it's it's often it's often a local thing. Much of it, at least. Uh, is you can at least agree that much of it is a local thing. And so the way that you interact with yourself, we we can't be naive to think that that doesn't bleed over into the way that we expect God to uh, act and behave and to interact with ourselves. And so, um, yeah, I just want to be in, in harmony. I just want to have harmony. I want to have congruent, con- con- congruity with myself and with others and one of the ways I start doing that is being kind to my body and living understanding with it. And the language that I use with it uh, will be gentle because I understand the power that it has when I use it for or against myself. Wow, almost 30 minutes. That was a long video.